Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, SDN enabled path switching. Um, SDN because that's the workshop. Um, path switching, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So um, I'm going to be <laughs> telling you guys stuff you totally know, but I'm going to pretend Mike doesn't. Okay. So how is routing done in the internet now? So it's it's um, based on forwarding tables. So when router R gets a packet and sees that it's going to that destination, it looks it up in the forwarding table and says, oh, well, if it's going to that destination, I shove it out port two or three or whatever it is. Okay? So that's nice. Um, uh, it, how do we get these routing tables? Well, you know, they're built by uh, distributed protocols like BGP or RIP or whatever. Okay, so it it works. Um, one of the problems is that uh, these destination-based tables grow as as uh, address blocks get fragmented. You know, v6, whatever, they get bigger and bigger. And it also doesn't allow for what I'm going to call flexible policy-based routing. Um, and again, I'll pretend you don't know what that means. Um, so let's suppose you have this situation where you know packets are coming in at S and they want to go out to D. So they all have the same destination, but some of them I don't trust. So I have to stick them through a firewall, maybe codec, till they get to D. But then other packets, well, I still don't trust them, but I don't have to code or decode them or whatever. Right? But they're all going to the same destination. These guys I totally trust, and they can just take the purple route. I can't do that if it's destination-based routing, right? Um, but I want to be able to do that. So you can do it with uh, what I'm calling, and maybe it is called, flow-based routing uh, forwarding table. And that's each packet has, um, in a particular flow, think it has a color, you know, something in its header that tells you what color it is. And so, you know, the red ones go out port number three, the black ones go out port number three, the question mark, I don't know what color that is, that's why it's a question mark, um, blurple, they, they, they go out uh, port number three, whatever, so that's fine. So with that kind of stuff, we can do flexible policy-based routing, right? You just, the table tells you uh, for a particular kind of flow, where do I send it? But again, okay, so that's the uh, you know, advantage of it, but a disadvantage, of course, if you have these microflows, you have lots of them, all, a lot of different kinds of flows, the tables are getting bigger and bigger again, these flow-based tables, until you get the colors, you don't know what the names are. Um, so the question we asked was, well, is there some way to get this flexible policy-based routing without having your tables explode in size on you? Um, so what we're going to do is, is not a new idea, but what we're going to do is, is path encoding, meaning that for each uh, node, we're going to put some binary label on the ports. And in the header of a packet, we're going to encode the path we want it to follow. <coughs> so this one with 1011 uh, one sees 10, and think of it as erasing it as it reads it, or you know, move a pointer, however you want to think about it. Now it's got a 1-1 one, one in it. It says, oh, well, I sent it out that port. So every packet has to have this path uh, of, of port labels on it to get through. So you know, then what does is, what is a path encoded table look like? Well, it has one entry for every port on the router. And it says what the label is for that port. So you know, any router is going to have some bounded number of ports. It doesn't grow as the network grows. It's, it's small. I'm not sure the exact number, Jen, <laughs> but it's small um, compared to this other thing. And you, you can route how you wish. Um, so because it's SDN, of course, well, what's the SDN doing? Well, the controller is going to tell the uh, routers on the edge of the network what path uh, encoding do I put in this packet come from outside that I want to get to uh, E5. Um, so the SDN controller does that. And of course, it fills up. It, the SDN controller is also going to figure out what labels should routers put on their ports. 
and then tell them, and, and, and so then that's how they fill up their forwarding tables. So that's SDN. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, the advantage that I said, the table size is, is bounded by the number of ports. Um, flows or destinations increase, table size remains the same. All right? Um, of course, <laughs> there's no free lunch, right? So, well, it's going to take up space in the header to put this path encoding. So I want to minimize that as, as best as possible. Minimize the length of, of these encodings. Um, there's other issues. So, you know, one way to do it, of course, is to have um, fixed le length labels. So for every edge report coming out of here, they all have length two. So, you know, roughly log k, k is the number of um, ports, out outgoing ports. Um, and what we're going to look at in the next couple of slides is we're going to consider all the paths that go from S0 to the leaves of this network, the blue guys. And so if everybody gets, you know, a fixed length encodings, then the longest path encoding from S0 to a leaf is five. So one of these zero, 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 or, you know, there's other ones that have, I think there are other ones that have length five, okay? But if, if we allow for variable length path uh, labels, so here, it's got one of length one, one of length two, a couple of length three. We can actually shorten, the minimum, uh, get smaller maximum length path encodings, which is good, right? So in this case, the longest path has uh, encoding length three. So that way has length three, and then some other ones have length three. But that's the worst. <coughs> so you can do better if you have variable length encodings at each node, but of course, then it gets a little dodgy because, well, you know, path labels may not be in unique from a given place. So where do I send it? What, what am I doing? Um, with, if I only have local knowledge, um, these two paths have the same label, 0, 1. So if I see 0, 1, I could send it that way, or 0, 1, maybe I sent it that way. I don't know. And it, it sort of gets a little worse in the sense that my slide gets more crowded. Um, it, it may not be decodable if, if, even if the encodings are unique, if you don't know what else is going on in the network. So in this case, I might think that, uh, you know, this path of zero one, I could send it that way or that way, but if I send it that way, it's not gonna get to a leaf. But I would have to know more about what the network looks like than my immediate neighborhood. How, how is this unique, though? I mean, what do you mean by unique? So I, I, what I mean by unique is if I look at any path from here oh, to, a to a leaf, they're all distinct. OK? So how do we do that? Well, it's actually, I forgot to say who my co-authors were. Harry from Bell Labs and Urs Niesen, who's now at Qualcomm, who's uh, an information theorist who, whose importance will come in, in here. But this, is, this is Harry's idea to do this. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, at each node, I want the labels to be prefix free, meaning that you know, here, this label zero, none of the other ones start with zero. None of them start with one one other than that one and so on. Because, you know, then when I get a path in, I just read until I see a label that belongs to me. And I know there's no sense reading further because no other, uh, no extension of that will be uh, a label of a node of mine. Okay? So I can unambiguously uh, decode a path encoding if it's prefix free. Okay, well, that's nice. Well, how do we compute a prefix free labeling? Um, so I'm going to go through some preliminaries before I answer that question. Um, just some notation. So out of S just means the arcs that are coming out of a, a node, S. Um, and the length of a binary label on an arc, I'm gonna, uh, arc A, I'm going to call it L sub A. And here's the piece from uh, information theory that I didn't know 
it's just a definition for now and you'll wonder well, who cares, but it's just this thing called Kraft's inequality that says if I have a code with code words W1 through WK and they have length L1 through LK, then this code is said to satisfy Kraft's inequality if this inequality holds. So 1 over 2 to the Li, sum them up, and if that's less than or equal to 1, it satisfies Kraft's inequality. Um, and the other idea we're going to use is think of tree codes. <coughs> so a tree code is a binary tree labeled with uh, the nodes are 0 and 1, depending if you go left or right. And so if a code word is 0, 1, think of it as taking that path, 1, 1, 0, encodes that blue node. And notice that it's a prefix free co uh, code if no two, choosen, uh, no two nodes in your encoding are on the same path to the root. Okay. So here's the theorem we're going to use is that uh, a prefix, we have a prefix free code or a labeling if and only if it, it satisfies Kraft's inequality. Okay. So in other words, when we're looking for uh, prefix free code, we can concentrate on um, those that satisfy Kraft's inequality. We don't lose anything by assuming that they satisfy Kraft's inequality. And this theorem actually is constructive in the sense that it'll give you such a code. Okay? So uh, I'll try to go through it. Um, so without lots of generality, we'll assume that the uh, lengths are ordered like that. Um, and suppose they satisfy Kraft's inequality. Okay? Then this is the algorithm to, to get a, a prefix free thing is consider the full binary tree, LK, uh, of depth LK. And at step I of the uh, algorithm, we're going to choose a node of, at depth LI um, and then remove all its descendants from the tree and continue. Okay? So here, if I'm at step two and I say, well, I'm going to choose that red guy to be in my code, I choose it, I remove the descendants of, of the red guy, and now I'm ready to do step three, and I can choose anything at level three, and I'm fine. It won't be a, on the same path as, as the red guy, right? Because I threw away the, the descendants. Of course, the question is, will I always be able to do that? And, well, the answer is yes. So what happens is, well, we start out, out with two to the LK um, leaves. Every time we remove the descendants, we remove that many. Well, we can just rewrite that. And when we rewrite it, what we see is Kraft's inequality sitting in there telling us that that's non-negative. So it's greater than zero. So there's always some node to choose. We don't run out. Um, and then going the other way, to, to show that it's sufficient to consider these, suppose we have a prefix free code. Um, and again, we're going to look at that tree of depth LK. Um, uh, if we look at a code word of length LI, consider all the uh, leaves underneath that in the tree. Okay? And because it's prefix free, these sets are uh, independent. And so if we just do the arithmetic, da 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 it implies Kraft's inequality. So it's an if and only if thing, and it's constructive, so we can, so the, you know, the, the program is we're going to find encodings that satisfy Kraft's inequality at each node, and we know that'll be prefix free, and, we, and if it's the smallest one, you know, minimizes the maximum length of a path encoding, then you, we couldn't have done better by looking at some other kind of thing. Okay, so that's exactly that's what all I'm saying here. It's a valid encoding, it's a labeling of the arcs where um, at every node we satisfy Kraft's inequality for all, all the outgoing ports. And then the length of the path <laughs> is somehow a subscript of is. Um, but anyway, it's just the sum of the lengths of the encodings. That's really weird. It looks fine on here. Extra gravity over there. Anyway, um, so <coughs> what, what's the problem we want to solve is that we're given a, a digraph and a set of paths. So these are the paths we want to encode within the 
within the graph. Um, and we want to find the labeling of the arcs to minimize the maximum uh, path length. And we're going to call that the optimal path encoding problem. Okay. So value labeling means it has to satisfy craft inequality. And to just give you sort of an idea of what crafts inequality constrains you to do but allows you to do is, you know, let's suppose you had four outgoing arcs. I could label them all with length two labels. And that's one over two to the two, one over four, that's fine. It's, it's less than or equal to one. But I could also spread things out a bit. So think if I have long paths going <coughs> out here, I might want to give this one a, a label of length one and throw some of the weight at somebody else. So you can, you, that's the flexibility we'll have to move things around. Anyway, so of course, <laughs> it's NP-hard, okay, um, to, to minimize this thing. But uh, it, it's actually NP-hard to, to get it within 8 over 7 of optimal, okay? And the way we're going to do it is for a reduction from a very strange case of SAT wha, uh, that has two or three variables in each clause. And each variable is involved in, in at most three clauses. So the end result is that xi, say, appears in at most two clauses. And not xi appears in at most two, and the other one one. Because if, if xi was in all three clauses, we'll just get rid of them. You know, set xi true, and we're good. Um, so we're going to have these little gadgets uh, for each variable xi, and think of this as, you know, there may be two clauses with not xi in it, there may be two with xi, and then there's a dummy in the middle to force us to kind of make a choice. And what do I mean? Well, okay, so for a clause, what we do is just glue these gadgets together, say three of them in this case, um, and then the path we want to encode will be the one that goes through the various literals of that clause. Okay, and the reason the dummies there is what I can do here is I can set one of these to one, but only one. And one of them, and, you know, then I can set the other two to two. I don't really care what I do with the dummy, so I always give the dummy as much as I can. Um, but I can only give one of them a one, otherwise, you know, if I gave these two one, then to satisfy Kraft's inequality, I don't know what I give this, infinity or something. Um, so, if you take a look at what it means when a clause is satisfied, it means that one of these edges coming into the literal is labeled 1. So, I give it a, a label of length 1. So, if, if the clause is true, it'll have length at most 7. It might have better if, you know, maybe it's got a couple of literals that get set to true. Um, but if it's not satisfied, then all these three edges get set to two, and then the length is at least eight. No, in fact, it is eight. Okay, so we can't do any better. Uh, there's a little more to it in, in the sense that there are also these clauses that only have two uh, literals in them. And so we have to make this kind of dummy gadget to stick at the end to kind of stretch things out. And you can just kind of think of, it has to get one of these of length one, and these guys will always make it look as though the third one was false, even though there is no third one. So we get this eight over seven bound. Now we're gonna look at, well, how well can we do in an approximation? We know we can't do better than eight over seven, but eh. Anyway, so we set up this, this program. Uh, what do we wanna do? We wanna minimize L subject to the uh, constraint that the length of all the paths in my path set are length most L. Satisfies Kraft's leading quality, and I want these to be integer. So if I could optimize, if I could satisfy this, I'll call that the solution, the integer solution, where these are the lengths of the labels, and that's the resulting maximum length path. Okay? Well, I can't quite do that, but with a relaxed version of rewriting, I get this 
geometric program that, that I can solve, and we'll call its solution L star and L A star. So we can solve this, but then, well, okay, we're just going to round it up. Okay? So we have the rounded solution, which is just the rounding up of, of this uh, relaxed version that we can solve. And we want to know how bad is that. Okay, so just to repeat, we have the integer solution that we really, that we want, the optimal solution. We, we can get the uh, relaxed solution, so okay, and the rounded optimal solution, well, we're going to settle for that. Okay, we can compute it, it's integer, what is it? Well, one uh, tiny little thing we're going to use that well, anyway, it's typically easy to overlook, is that we want to say that if uh, the integer solution would have put weight zero on an edge, um, you know, a length zero label, then without loss of generality, we can assume that the uh, fractional one would as well. Because what does it mean to put zero? It means that to satisfy craft inequality, all the other ones have, uh, there's nothing. I mean, you know, you can't put away, uh, you can't give them anything, finite length. So, in fact, the fact we're going to use is that whenever this is greater than zero, the integer version will be greater than zero. Okay, so then there's this trivial little thing that says that the uh, rounded version is actually a two approx. Okay, so, well, it's, it's clearly a valid labeling because it's going to be less than or equal to the optimal one. Um, so it's going to be valid. And let's look at a path where it actually reaches the maximum length, okay? So how can we write that? That's the rounded version, so that's the fractional version, plus maybe one for every uh, arc in er, every label in there that's at least zero. That's where we, we use this little fact that that means that this is also greater than zero. Well, what's that? That's just that again, right? So, um, I mean, it's no more than this, because it's at least one, that's one, so it's twice. Kind of simple. So we, we know it's, you know, we can't do better than eight over seven, we have two, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so we have some experimental results where we looked at various networks, and, you know, what we did was, well, we'll just, look at uh, all pairs shortest paths and try to encode them as best as possible. Um, and then we devised a, a gradient descent algorithm. You can get it from the entropy uh, form of the dual. Uh, I won't go into the details. But anyway, so we, you know, it's actually a sort of a simple algorithm to approximate what we're trying to do. Um, and on these two networks, if we use the fixed length encodings, we need 15 and 25 with this gradient descent satisfying all these um, crafts inequalities, we reduce it by like 30%. It's pretty decent. Um, and then just a little quick note at the end. I actually think of this as a finer grain model where, you know, what we were looking at before was a node was a router. But I actually think of a router as kind of a little network in itself, you know, from input ports to output ports. And so if I look at these red, green, and blue paths, I need you know, to put lengths one, two, and two on these things. But if I think of it as this way, if I blow it up and say, well, these paths are going from this input port to that output port, or that one or that one, these all are the only art coming in from this output port to this input port, so that has length zero. I don't have to worry about these guys in here. So I can get much smaller labelings um, if I blow this thing up and look at it at a different scale. And so that's it. You know, we, we introduce this problem, we show that the, it's APX hard to solve, but we have a two approximation and experiments on this uh, gradient descent algorithm gives us a 30% reduction. And I have how many seconds left? 20. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to close the gap between two and eight or seven. We're working on multicast solutions with this. Thank you, and I hope I meet it.
Uh oh, first break. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm stuck really cool. I was just curious if you have an algorithm for generating the whole table in the switch. Because it seems like any switch could be on, could be the second hop in a path, or the third hop in a path, or the fourth hop in a path. So it doesn't seem easy to know where in the, in the header to look for it. Oh, so. Or maybe I didn't. No, I didn't say anything about where to put. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, get a, you must get some table to look for whatever. So. No, the um, Harry has a way of encoding this in in the header in some place. I, I don't know the details. <laughs> I knew somebody would ask me. I told you. Yeah, and then you can think of just stripping the bits off as you read them, or you move a pointer along. You know, either way. Yeah. So, in your SDN slide, one thing you lost over a little was SDN slide. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that you actually have to have at every edge router. Yeah. A, a table showing for every destination what the path is, what, what the sequence of labels is. Yes. So, so you know, everything else is nice about yeah. the fact that your lookup based yes. on label reports is yes. constant. Yes. But every edge router has. Yes. Help. So I think. But you can oh. justify that and say, oh, well, I was going to. Yes, go ahead. Help me. I wanted my policy to be that for every path, I get to choose what it does in the network. Yes. And so I don't have a choice. That's right. I mean, if, if you are specifying those paths, well, I'm going to specify a it's encoding. It doesn't seem like too unfair. Yeah. Plus, the idea was to get all the um, state out of the, the, the interior of the network. Does, does the two approximation work if you had weighted the, the paths or the destinations? Weighted them. In the sense that you know that some leaves get more traffic than others, and you now want to minimize the, the weighted sum of the leaves. Oh, that's a pretty good question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but probably. Uh, although. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, that's right, a good question. I like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. How many hops is the longest path that you looked at that you were Oh, did I look at? <laughs> All mine were on view graphs. Uh, I mean, uh, on slides. Um, I, I think it was probably seven or something. I don't really know. It, it, you mean in those experiments? Yeah. Like it showed you I, I honestly don't know what, uh, how long the paths were, hopwise. Yeah. Yeah. I think if the, um, if the destinations had weight, it would split on the hop encoding, right? So that's uh, the the the, easy, the the probable answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that shows the extent of my knowledge of information theory. <laughs> so you need hop encoding along with some prefix coding. So yeah. Like combination yeah. 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 Well, you're doing it in many, many different locations, so you're reading up on little pieces, little pieces. So it's somehow concatenation of two different kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we consider the length of the going itself. Uh, for example, how many bits do you need to? Yeah, I mean, I have to put the length of the path encoding in the header of the packet, and that's why I'm trying to minimize the maximum length to make sure uh, it fits within whatever limit I have on on, on the packet. No, I think it's saying there's a very limited number of bits. We should also say how many bits to the the soft soft term. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you.